So good morning. Uh, I am Steve Bennett. I was the co-founder of Caravanserai with Mihai, and I serve as chairman of the board and, and on the faculty. I do a lot of the training. Uh, I also sit on the board of the California Endowment, which is a very large healthcare philanthropy in California. I sit on the board of the Arcus Foundation, which does LGBT social justice and conservation work. Uh, I also sit on a board in, that's in New York, and I sit on a board in Florida for a chimpanzee sanctuary called Save the Chimps, and then I serve on this board. So uh, I've moved back and forth from the for-profit to the not-for-profit sector, and I've been on both sides of making grants and, and getting grants. And we, I want to just frame this issue a little bit, because we're going to go into, get pretty granular about some of the things you nearly, you really need to watch for and some of the opportunities. But the, it, 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 we're managing a grant and managing your relationship between your funder is a relationship that's built on communication and trust that you can mess up sometimes. You can go back and often ask for maybe a change in the way the money is allocated. You cannot do any of that unless you have the trust of your funder and you need to build those relationships. And they've got to be, trust is built on honesty and integrity. And in the short term, you may get a grant from somebody but in the long term, if you're going to continue to get grants and get funding, you need to build a reputation of integrity. And, and people know that you will say you do what you say and that you follow the rules and you deliver the impact. So it, to me, uh, as a funder, I have to say um, it, the key is, is making sure that that relationship is strong and honest and pure and, and being upfront. No, no, uh, no finessing on the budget, no uh, stretching the limits. Play by the rules. You'll be much better off in the long run. Uh, but if, and if you have trouble, communicate it if things change. We'll talk more about that. But I, I just want to say this is a partnership. Funders see you as their arms and legs. And I know with the endowment, which this year will give away around $350 million, we have three categories of grantees. One is that $25,000, $30,000 gift uh, to, to help, help a small project. And then those who are uh, projects that we fund and we want to know that they're really delivering the service. But the third level is what we call partners, people we've worked with for a long time. We know their honesty, we know their vision, we know their mission, we know their commitment to it. And we give them multi-million dollar, multi-year grants of general operating money. Hi. And if any of you, uh, yeah. and all of you run not-for-profits, I oh, am sorry. sure that the mere idea of getting a multi-year, multi-million dollar grant for general operating makes your mouth water. <laughs> because, it, you know, that's kind of the dream place to be. And what we're really saying is to get there, it takes homework and it takes really following through with your commitments. So I want to turn this over to Bradley for a moment to start talking about some of the uh, basic benchmarks we need to pay attention to uh, as we move into building uh, grants um, from all kinds of sources. Bradley? Yeah, thank you, Stephen. So hi, everybody. I'm, my name is Bradley Chargaloff. I'm the program manager here at Caravanserai Project. I deal with all the technicalities and implementation. So if you have any questions about any of our offerings or our services, feel free to reach out to me. I'm local here to the region in the Inland Empire. I lived here all my life. So I look uh, forward to working with some of you. And I know we already work with, with some of you. But again, just great to meet all of you. Um, but before we really jump into some of the details, let's really talk about the basics and, you know, what it takes to qualify for a grant and these, you know, these threshold events. How, we're really here just addressing how to set your organization up for the highest chance to be awarded. And we know that you've already received uh, some awards or, or awards, so congratulations, but we really just wanted to touch up on this as a reference point for the presentation. Um, so first off, you really need to make sure you're in compliance and that you are prepared to deal with the, with the grant should you receive it. That means licenses and cred credentials, making sure you have all the necessary ones and that they're up to date. 
Stephen mentioned before we started, but if you didn't hear, an example is that um, we at Caravans Right Project, we're actually incorporated in Washington, D.C., but our primary work is in the Inland Empire. But to qualify for some of the grants that we've received here in California, we have to register as uh, what they call a foreign agent. So it's just stuff like that. And, you know, we see that the tribe's reach is really quite grand. So this is, you know, very ap applicable. You know, they may, they may not ask for them, but if you qualify, just expect to have these documents ready and on hand. Um, make sure your taxes are up to date. And, and we'll kind of mention this in the upcoming slides, but, um, you know, we had an organization that we were in contact recently who had just filed their 2016 taxes. Uh, they came to us and they wanted help getting some grants, um, but, you know, a donor grantor would never really ever consider giving them any amount of money. So you don't really wanna waste your time or anybody else's. Um, you wanna have certain policies in place and we'll really talk more in depth about this throughout the presentation. Um, you wanna make sure you obtain the insurances that will protect you and your organization from liabilities. We recommend looking at Cal nonprofits and their insurance services segment. Um, check it out and see if, you know, it's the right fit for your organization. I'll drop a, a link shortly. Um, and this again kind of falls under the statement of just making sure you can deliver upon these services. You want to make sure you have the policies, the protocols to really implement and execute this grant. You don't want to set you and your organization up to fail. As we'll mention frequently throughout the presentation, it, kind of, it goes back to building trust, these structural lines of communication with your grantor that will set your organization up for future growth because a happy grantor can be a repeat grantor and getting repeat awards gives you a lot of leverage and credibility for future ones. So I'll pass it over to Martin. Hi everyone, Martin Derrick here, the Administrative Officer of Caravan Shirai. Um, I'm going to go over some, those of you who had a lot of experience receiving grant money, um, some of the accounting processes I'm discussing, you might already be familiar with, but I'm going to review them anyway. The uh, 501c3 uh, status, uh, we have to make sure that you're in constant, that you're in constant watch of that to make sure your status remains current. There's also the Secretary of State Statement of Information form that needs to be completed and filed every year. And also, your annual tax filings, um, Form 990, those have to go in. And those, as of this year, I believe, are only being accepted electronically. So that being said, um, I'd like to kind of jump into the chart of accounts. And just to illustrate, your chart of accounts should be right up next to your organization's mission they should really just be partners. Your chart of account should match the mission, the grant specifications, what you have to report, everything in your chart of accounts should be the foundation for any other financial reports you need to provide to the grantor. Um, some people think of it as an extensive filing cabinet. So anything that's in your chart of accounts, it should generate any reports you might need uh, to report your, your, uh, to, uh, on your grants. Also, um, just to mention, there's, if you don't have a, a designated person already on board, hiring somebody with accounting experience is a good idea. Um, de designate somebody on your staff that's going to keep track of everything, that's going to keep track of your expenses, that's going to be keep track of uh, how the money is allocated, how it's being spent. If you're overspending in one area or you need to, you know, have a little bit of room to do other things, that person should be the one taking care of, uh, of it. And as an executive director, uh, you may or may not be that person, but if there isn't a person, really consider getting one. Also a comprehensive accounting software like QuickBooks. It's, there's a form of QuickBooks that's designated specifically for nonprofit use and makes it easy to configure your chart of accounts for your organization as it relates to a nonprofit. 
Even further, it allows your nonprofit to draw information directly from your chart of accounts to create any additional accounting reports and statements. Um, one thing we're doing here at Caravan Sarai is all, all the entire staff has a very detailed timesheet that they submit every week with how much time they're spending in each uh, one of our programs, our projects, uh, admin, whatever the case may be, it, it provides us the opportunity to manage not only keeping track of the activities covered by the grant, but also how much money is being spent on each one of our programs. Uh, basically, I think that that covers everything. I think Stephen's going to cover some more specific stuff. But uh, yeah. thank you, Martin. Uh, I, you know, I'm a finance guy, so the idea of of our chart of accounts is nearly as important as our mission. I love. <laughs> it may not be what we usually think of, uh, but you know, as they say, uh, no money, no mission. Uh, and a chart of accounts is really a starting point for managing grants often. And those of you who are not familiar with fund accounting, uh, in the not-for-profit sector, we've often used a, what we call a fund accounting system where we set up a sub, uh, on the books at least, a kind of a sub-organization where we stick the grant money and we bill the grant money against the money we've earned as we fulfill the requirements of the grant. And we usually publish that statement along with our PL and our balance sheet. So, yeah, if, if, so we're, this isn't an accounting class. We're not going to go any further on that. But uh, uh, QuickBooks can do that for you. But as you, when you get a grant, one of the first things you should need to do is check your chart of accounts and see if you're going to be able to record your expenses against that grant. Um, I, I want to talk about understanding the agreement a little bit. Uh, we get different kinds of grant agreements, and I know all of you do as well, and, and some of them are very clean and simple, and they say, you know, we're glad to give you this $25,000 or $5,000 and go forth and prosper. But as time goes on, you will see, particularly as you uh, get larger grants, or some of you who are very sophisticated already know this, but when you get a grant, uh, there's usually an agreement, and that agreement really is a contract. And we strongly suggest that when you get those kinds of agreements that you realize they are contracts and that you should have an, uh, an attorney consult and review those contracts and make sure you're very clear about what it is that's expected of you when you need to report and what your per uh, probable liabilities are. Um, and this can be extraordinarily helpful and sometimes and, and often you can go back to the funder and discuss any of these issues with them and get those clarified. Secondly, you, you enter into these agreements and they're fa fairly static agreements and they're based on what you put in your proposal and they may be based on what is known about your organization financially and from a management point of view. And one of the key things you need to do after you get a grant is if there's any major changes between the time you wrote the grant and got the grant, and then as time goes on after you've received the grant until the grant time period is over, that you need to inform the grantor of any major changes. If the CEO leaves, if you have a major lawsuit that puts you in jeopardy, if you are starting to have cash flow problems and don't know if you're gonna be continuing your operations or are making some major cutbacks in your organization. Uh, funders are very understanding about that if they've been informed. They don't wanna read in the paper that you know the CEO left or the whole board resigned and they didn't hear about it beforehand. They are your partners. Keeping them informed is extremely important. And third is this is the idea of most grants will have a timeline and a reporting uh, um, with milestones or, or um, um, 
benchmarks that you have to perform. You need to make sure that you have a system that will remind you to do these things, uh, uh, that you're collecting the correct, correct data that you need to report. I, I, I find that most of the grants that I'm seeing want to know, you know, how many uh, BIPOC people we're serving, how many rural people we're serving. They want to know gender. They want to know all kinds of data. And if you don't have that as built into your system to do the reporting that's required of you, you're going to be at a deficit. Now, <clears throat> as we may, uh, I may have, may have, me, I may have mentioned, you know, we don't have um, copies of your um, grant uh, announcements from um, the tribe. Uh, we're basing this on all grants and grants that, that are in addition to San Manuel. And so we believe that a building for the future and building your infrastructure includes having systems that can manage grants and manage the compliance to the grant. And so we suggest, particularly if they're multifaceted grants or are large grants, that one of the first things you do is start by building an implementation plan and a timeline and a schedule internally to use to fulfill the requirements of the grant. Uh, and I think you'll find this, this um, uh, very helpful. Um, I, I wanna also uh, talk for just a moment on the financial reporting. So could I have the next slide, please? So uh, we talked a little earlier about separate accounting. This is what we mean by fund accounting and setting up a chart of accounts that can identify what costs. No, not it. this. You dropped it last time. Uh, okay. Well, uh, um, the, 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 this is very important in your grant making. Okay. And you want to keep uh, all your finance reporting particularly clean. Uh, Martin brought it up a few moments ago, but it, with a number of funders, um, they will look at your records to prove that you spent the time and the money in the right place. And even though you may have a grant that is pretty lax in asking you for reporting how the money was spent, uh, you need to have systems, however, that can really do what Martin was talking about in keeping all of the records and making sure that small bills are not charged to grants, uh, that you, you keep very clear records on that. And I know if some of you have been uh, funded by the government or take uh, funding for Medicaid, uh, Medicare, uh, uh, CMS money, uh, that they really do a lot of clawbacks. And I have seen situations in Louisiana and Pennsylvania, um, in Rhode Island, and, and obviously uh, here in California, where they come back in and they want to see that uh, that service was provided. They want to know who provided it, what time they provided it, that it's initialed by the person. And if they don't have that kind of record, they want the money back. And these companies that work for the government on the clawbacks, they get a percentage of what they claw back. They're highly incentivized. And, and I know, Elisa, in Maryland, you probably uh, uh, know how some of these government funding works, but it's very important that people um, everybody involved in providing the services on a complex grant keeps a very detailed record so that if there ever is an audit, you can pull up all of that information if you need to. Uh, we, we got this Wells Fargo grant jointly with Susan Gomez, who is also uh, here today, who's one of our, also one of our board members. And I, they, we, we share our, our billing on this grant. And I've just got to say, uh, Susie's put together a system that is extraordinarily comprehensive, even on soft money. And it's, it's, it's very impressive. And it's worth your time to design a system that can do that, whether you use it on every grant or not. Um, so I, I want to move on uh, to back to Bradley on some of the implementation points we want to make. Yeah, so implementation, really communication is key. Um, it just go, it's basically just the core tenant throughout the, the grant period, but just be honest and upfront with your, your grantor. You just wanna maintain that, especially throughout the implementation. 
and a big point as well as scheduling in, in advance. Um, because the more prepared you are, you'll be more proactive in, in changing plans. Just as an example, we here at Caravan Safari, we plan at least three months ahead for all of our programs. Uh, we have programs scheduled up to February of next year. And that doesn't necessarily mean you're just sitting on, you know, stuff and you're just waiting for stuff to be sent out because that obviously has its downsides. But it just means being able to have a plan that organizes you and keeps you on track. Um, just plan out when they're going to be rolled out, not necessarily the details, uh, but like plan when you'll work out the details. Um, and the point here is establishing a system of monitoring and evaluations. We'll go really in depth with Mihai in the following slides, but I just wanted to briefly point out a couple of things from an implementation point of view. Uh, during the implementation, just make sure you have ongoing compliance plans and depending if it applies, check your contracts with potential subcontractors and subgrantees because there usually isn't a, uh, an agreement with the grantor and subgrantees. So you'll be responsible for making sure everything is handled correctly and that you're complying with all requirements. Uh, Martin mentioned this, but clear roles and, um, and responsibilities kind of connects back to, to implementation. It allows you to schedule everything properly and allows you to monitor and track the grant implementation. You don't want to jumble and mix a lot as it won't allow you to really track your progress and how you're dealing with the implementation of the grant. You know, as nonprofits uh, and mission-driven organizations, it really seems like, you know, we're assigned this one role, but we're really doing this role and that role. So, but, you know, it just goes back to that quote we shared at the beginning, just having that capability and that capacity to manage and monitor as much as you can, because it will really set you up for bigger and better grants that do require you to track a lot more. Um, and Stephen touched upon this, but just from an implementation, again, st standpoint, let the grants or know of any changes in the actual plan and, and, and expenses. And this is made easier on everybody. Um, your organization and the grants were the more you schedule in advance. Grant periods can be, you know, can be quite long. So change in staff, change in organization, change in program that affects your implementation, it can happen. So just be sure to communicate it. You want to anticipate the changes and be proactive in changing plans and communicating those changes. You know, just because you made a plan doesn't mean you can adjust it. Um, it sometimes it's, it's better, right? The implementation period is where you really show what your organization is capable of and how you deal with, with those challenges. Um, and again, we kind of mentioned this um, before, but complying with the budget you included in the grant request. Do the expenses match what the agreement proposal was and how does the implementation affect it? Many grantors, again, are flexible, but you have to be honest, you have to be upfront and you have to be organized as well. You want to communicate these changes in advance during, during the implementation. They most likely won't increase the amount, right? But they'll be able to help you move around maybe some of the money and what it can be used for. This again all ties into unrestricted versus restricted grants, maybe some time restrictions as well. Um, what can you use that money for? And you know, what programs can pull from which funds and just goes back to understand the grant agreement and what you agreed to and what you can do. Um, and overall, really, implementation is really about this communication we've been talking about throughout. You applied, you have got the award. Now it's up to you to really do what you do best. But just it's making sure you keep everybody in the loop, your organization, all your roles, your staff, and keeping the grantor, and just being proactive about the, the whole process. I'll pass it over to Mihai. Uh, you maybe muted me high. Yeah. Well, after three years of on Zoom, I am, you would expect people would learn. Anyway, so uh, monitoring and evaluation and reporting impact. At the end of the day, the grantor, the funder, the donor, this is what they want to see, right? That your organization is able to achieve impact. And moving forward is also a tool that you can use the data you are collecting the stories that you are uh, learning from your beneficiaries you can use that in moving forward in future relations with um with your potential uh, uh, supporters um basically it's reporting what 
grantors are looking for is for us as grantees to respect the timeline and deliver what we have um, promised. And just quote, I was reading uh, yesterday some of the contracts that we have signed for uh, with our grantors. And there is a phrase that I keep finding is, the performance reports will include, will include, but not be limited to the following information. And for us, we understand that the, they want you to do more. They, they want us to do more. These are just the minimum expectations that a grant, grant tour um, is, is looking to see during the implementation uh, period or at the end of, at, at the, end of the grant. Uh, we kept mentioning about the importance of reading uh, the call for applications or the grant uh, contract. Uh, there it's, they are very clearly stated the purpose, the priorities, the funding categories and duration reporting, performance reports, when are these due, but more importantly, and what we have learned firsthand is we keep engaging with the donor or the grantor. And we recently had a call with one of them. They are looking to uh, provide additional support uh, in terms of being more clear about the reports that they are expecting from us. Um, the Wells Fargo grant, and we recently were awarded a grant, a grant from the California Office for Small Businesses. Uh, they are extremely specific about uh, the outcomes, uh, the training events. They talk about clients and not only unique clients, but also new clients, trained clients, counseled clients. And they usually they, pro they provide definitions and their understanding of the of these categories that we can that will help us uh, navigate the monitoring, evaluation, and reporting process. Uh, obviously, we can't do reporting and we can't evaluate our work unless we collect data. And what we have learned. Uh, at Caravanserai is that we are looking at collecting data from a long-term perspective. Uh, what we learn about our beneficiaries, about, about the people that we are working with, we will use obviously to report back to a particular foundation or particular donor, but also to inform our work and learn more about how we can adjust our, uh, our programs and the services that we are providing. And I'm sure some of you are using different platforms to collect data. For example, at Caravanserai, we are using Eventbrite and you've already interacted with that platform. And the reason we are using that platform is that it was easier for us to connect it, to link it to the other platforms that we are using. For example, MailChimp and have the back ends of all these tools that we are using connected. And that really simplifies our work. Um, we are using intake forms and some of them might seem tedious. You are just the victim of one when you signed up for the workshop, but we are really paying attention to what you submit. We wanna know who you are prior to, the, the, to our meetings. And we've learned that it's easier to, to use these intake forms and ask our beneficiaries to uh, submit them prior to our meeting, it's kind of challenging to ask them to fill intake forms up post factum. What we do at the end of each event, and I'm sure a lot of, uh, of you are doing the same, you're asking your participants, your beneficiaries, your customers to provide feedback. And that for us is equally crucial because we are using uh, the stories, your feedback, in the reporting that we are provide. And reporting is not about, what we have learned is not only about data, right? Uh, 115 people sign up for this webinar. What we are mostly interested in is actually your feedback. We wanna learn from you and know uh, what do you think we should improve? What kind of information we should add to, uh, for us to get to improve our work? And as I mentioned earlier, it's not only a per, about a particular grant. We are also looking in the future and how we are gonna inform our future work, our future applications uh, based on what we learned from you, the stories that you are 
uh, sharing with us. And again, everything is about communication, whether as Stephen, Martin, and Bradley mentioned earlier, internal communication, external communication, and I think the best person to uh, learn from is Graciela. Thank you, Mihai. I appreciate that. Hi, everyone. How's everyone doing? Um, we're going to be talking today about communication strategies, and that's between praising the grantor and self-promoting. Um, but before I get a little bit into that, um, let me go ahead and introduce myself. Uh, my name is Graciela Moran. I'm the External Affairs Officer for Caravan Story Project. I am also an Inland Empire native, and also, too, I do see some alumni here, um, but I'm a Cal State San Bernardino alumni. I just graduated, so it's great to see all of y'all and seeing the Coyote family here. Um, so let's go ahead and start off with building the brand of the organization. Um, so we wanna just go ahead and make sure that you know, you're know you positioned on the market. And so kind of as an example, we discussed as a team different strategies, what works and who we wanna reach. For example, what works for us is LinkedIn, Instagram, and Facebook. And for you, it might look a little bit different where you kind of wanna have your demographic is a little bit different. It might be TikTok, Twitter, or YouTube. Um, and definitely use that, use social media as your biggest friend. Um, use a grant to position the work of your organization and raise awareness about your work. This is really your time to shine within the community. And what we did personally that really did work um, was we created a map of all the political figures, stakeholders in the region. And one of the, um, one of the grants that we did receive was a Wells Fargo grant. And it was a unique grant for us, mainly just because of the amount of money for the region. It was a large amount and it was an investment in the region. So we use that kind of to talk to our local legislators, local assembly members, and just kind of everyone in the community and how we can build from that grant and put it, invest it back into the Inland Empire. Um, and another point right here that we wanna go ahead and say is make sure the grantor wants to be known. And that kind of goes into compliance, non-disclosure and confidenti confidentiality agreements. Some grantors don't wanna be known and some grantors wanna be, do wanna be known. And so, for example, a little bit about um, one of the grants that we did receive, Mihai touched a little bit about it for the California Office of Small Business. We asked before um, we can announce it. So they just recently announced it. But before that, um, we wanted to definitely respect um, the, the Office of Small Business and, and not announce it without the, the approval. So just make sure that you do ask for that permission. And it helps with building trust. Um, when it comes to sharing um, and how you kind of build it. Stay in communication with your grantor and talk to them about the small things that you're doing. For example, even if it's just all the PR um, disseminations that you're doing, send that over to your grantor. Even if it's just, hey, um, we got published by, for example, the Desert Sun that we, we got published. Um, definitely do that because then that also too it's easier to communicate with them. And you don't ever wanna be on the edge of communicating with your grantor. You wanna feel comfortable too, because then that also too can help with, you know, them helping you out in situations that you might need them for. Um, if we can go to the next slide. Okay, so the second strategy. And as Mahai um, kind of talked about, you know, definitely these take this as a grain of salt. We're, we're encouraging you and empowering you. And definitely, you know, this is your, your moment to definitely um, build your communication strategy even further. So think in terms of your potential partnership and, you know, the funder trusted you and that means your work is great and everyone here, your work is impactful already because you were invited here. Um, so and definitely let other organizations know about your work, even um, if there's already a couple um, nonprofits or organizations that do the same work, work together. So I guess that kind of goes into networking build relationships to set the ground for partnership. And what we did is we actually applied as, um, as partners for the, Wells Fargo, for the Wells Fargo grant. Susie's here um, with IECC, but we partnered um, with her. And then also too, we, pound, uh, we partnered with the Community Foundation of the Inland Empire. And all grantors, they appreciate partnerships and actually favor applicants who are in partnership. It's rethinking that you're not in competition. You need to work together and support each other. And it's one of the strategies of the Inland Empire so we can move forward. And I know in the Inland Empire um, and different regions, we're based on survival, but we have to work together in order to move forward. And also to one last thing is a beneficiary experience. Um, how you communicate with your beneficiaries. What is your impact and how did you change your life? Definitely communicate that and let your grantor know um, because then that makes the work um, all truly um, impactful.
So thank you. I'm going to go ahead and pass it over to, I believe, me. Hi. Thank you, Graciela. Um, one of the last two topics that we want to touch upon is building your using grants and uh, the support that you're receiving from different donors, foundations, state agencies to build your organizational wealth, but also generate revenue for your uh, venture. And I mentioned earlier that despite while we are a 501c3, our approach when it comes to the business model that we adopted is a hybrid one. It's a mix of grants, it's a mix, mix of fees that we uh, we get from consulting and, and other serv services that Caravanserai is, uh, is providing. And uh, Graciela all mention, already mentioned about how important it is to use a grant that you already have to build partnerships and actually um, get other grants. Uh, also, we've started Graciela, Bradley, and Martin joined our team in August because of the opportunity we got with the Wells Fargo grant. And when we applied for the grant, we knew that we want to take the organization to the next level. And we included in the budget uh, the hiring of three people. Other grants might not allow you. And this is the example that we recently have with the Office of uh, Small Businesses of California. They were very strict about not hiring you, using the grant to hire new people. What they were what they allowed us to do was to get on board contractors. So we reach out to our previous partners that we trusted and we had a, uh, already established a relation with them and we are able to bring them on board and be part of our, our journey moving forward. Um, it's also about growing the infrastructure, not necessarily in terms of human resources, but the material infrastructure. We've learned firsthand that we can't deliver programs, we can't provide services unless we have you know, good technology, access to good computers. So that really, uh, we are trying to incorporate in any type of grant that we are applying for, uh, make sure that it's not only about investing in the programs that we are offering, but really investing in organizations. Um, ask for matching gifts. And we've learned this as well. Every time we get a grant or uh, financial support, we use that in order to reach out to uh, private donors, to people that have supported us and other organizations as well to um, leverage and ask them for additional support. I, I think it's very important, maybe more of a mental impact when you ask somebody for money to start a program. Imagine, think how powerful it is when you're asking an organization or a foundation or a private donor to support expanding the program. And this is what we've done with the grant we have received from the Office of Small Businesses of California. It was a matching grant. And we leverage the Wells Fargo grant in order to expand our program and add different services and other aspects, improve the work that we were already doing. And the last thing is to generate revenue. And this is more of a social business uh, uh, enterprise approach, which Caravanserai has adopted from the beginning. Uh, we are leveraging some of the grants that we have to generate more income for the organization. In some cases, we are uh, asking our participants to cover some of the costs of the program from 10% to 50%. And that really helps us. It also provides, empowers our beneficiaries because they feel invested in, in the work that, uh, that we do. Uh, most of the grantors don't have, are not restricting when it comes, restrictive when it comes to this approach. On the contrary, for example, in the Wells Fargo contract, uh, they are very clear. We are allowed to generate revenue using the grant as long as that revenue will be reinvested in the organization. And Stephen, you have the floor to talk a bit about the future. So um, I, I know that we've repeated a few themes here on purpose. Uh, we also, um, 
you know, we talk a lot about Caravanserai. Uh, last year, we worked intensely with about 58 organizations. We had about over 600 separate organizations attend our webinars. And, and when we looked at this, not only did we put together our experience, but we decided in a sense to use our own organization as a case study and use it as, as example. So um, we choicefully made that decision to use us uh, in Caravanserai as a case study. So we've told you a lot about us today. Um, I, I want to talk about something that I think is very important about why we're talking about all of these things when you may have received a fairly, fairly small grant, it may be your only grant, and you're thinking, do I really need to do all this stuff? And so uh, one of the things I just want to point out is that the American Rescue Plan, which is also known as ARPA, um, that the money has been flowing but still in many states, more than half of it has not been, been spent yet. And we're gonna see another tranche spent in early 2022. And in California alone, there is about $55 billion left to be allocated. Uh, the second thing is that in a number of states, much to the surprise of, of um, the tax revenue folks, uh, there's been a huge increase in most state revenues who do taxes. In California, it's resulted in about last this year $46 billion in excess revenue. And uh, there's going to be at least another $25 billion added to that in the first part of 2022. Uh, the governor in California is very interested in using that money, probably particularly while he was being recalled. Uh, but I know since the legislature uh, took a break, uh, he's he will be signing over 300 bills between now and uh, January when the legislature starts again, altogether between what's left with the ARPA money and the state access will be over a hundred million billion dollars available. The bipartisan infrastructure framework bill, the federal bill, um, looks like it's going to be passed as of the last few hours. Uh, I know in California alone, it's 42, $52 billion. Uh, and then the recovery plan, which has been the big debate about the three and a half trillion um, in just the last hour, it was announced they just about settled on 1.85 trillion. Um, and they're now spelling out what the benefits will be. But a lot of them are social um, um, infrastructure. And I bring this up because um, we, we need to be prepared. Uh, one of the things that this causes is the government's got to figure out a way to design programs, implement them, who they're going to pay, how they're going to make sure the money gets to the right people, etc. And philanthropy is very concerned about making sure that people who are most often left out, and particularly the social service, social justice world that many of us live in, are given equal opportunity to get funded, and not just the you know, maybe older, richer, larger charities um, in, in the bigger cities and metropolitan areas. And so there is a lot of thinking about how to help build infrastructure and technical assistance to help you, us, all of us figure out how to access these funds better and have the infrastructure to do it. And that's part of the reason we've emphasized it so much today about getting your accounting systems get, uh, together, getting your um, record uh, uh, keeping in order, uh, making sure you know how to communicate. We're thinking about this in terms of making us all more prepared and able uh, to go after some of these funds because they're very important in building our social framework. So philanthropy is looking at that. It's looking at how we can change the narrative about some of this discussion uh, and how to build coalitions uh, that can have impact on how these programs are designed and implemented. So this is very important to us. So what we're saying to you is that though what we are talking about today, some of you may think, oh, this doesn't really apply to me. We would like to think of this also in terms of you being prepared for opportunities because our, this is a huge shift. Uh, we haven't seen this kind of money uh, made available through these kinds of sources 
really since Medicare and Medicaid was established, and which was now 60, 70 years ago. And so uh, this is huge. And if the government's not successful in getting this money out the door and getting it to the people that it's really intended to, it's gonna cause a lot of trouble for them and for the system as a whole. So we need to be looking at being part of the system, having a voice about how this is designed, but also as organizations being prepared and able and having the infrastructure and, and the ability to manage these kinds of funds. And, and there are such a, a variety of funds. And one other thing I wanna mention very quickly is that there will be funds coming down through local governments and states, through water districts, counties, cities, et cetera. Uh, but there's also a lot of private money coming down and for, for private investments in energy, water, et cetera, but also in community development, housing, and so forth. And they also are putting a lot of money into the sport of small businesses. And we want to make very clear that not most not-for-profits are, are small businesses. And we should make sure that we're at the table when our local and state governments are talking about funding and supporting small businesses because we are small businesses too. And we know in the Inland Empire that the not-for-profit sector represents 17% of the economy. And we create more jobs than any other part of the economy. We also pay better than most of the other new jobs that are being created in the economy, at least here in the Inland Empire. So, so think of yourselves not only as you are the implementation arm of this uh, government spending. You provide many of the uh, um, essential services in a community, and you're also a small business. So think of that context when you think about preparing yourself to be ready uh, for helping, really helping the government uh, spend these funds appropriately and using you as a vehicle to do that. Mihai, I'm turning it back over to you. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, I think, yeah, that's kind of basically just to reiterate what Stephen has just mentioned. The present, this presentation, but our work in general is really from the perspective of mission-driven organizations, nonprofits in particular, are small businesses. And that has been our approach from the beginning. And I think you know more and more people should embrace that when they reach out to uh, potential funders, to foundations, whether you know donors, whether uh, private or public. I think it's key to demonstrate to tell them that a nonprofit organization is a business, and especially in California, the nonprofit sector is the third largest employer in in, in the state. So that should count for something. Uh, I'm going to turn off the recording and then opening to uh, to questions. How much time do we have, Mihai? Um, we have about 25 minutes.